Great to see so many clients here today uh, for this eagerly awaited panel uh, on the Middle East. It's my distinct honor to welcome you to this, this panel discussion today and introduce our speakers. I'm going to be very brief uh, so that we can allow as much time as possible to hear what they have to say and to ask questions. On this eminent panel, we have Dr. Mohammed El Baradeh. Loué Al-Khatib, and the Right Honourable Sir John Major. And with that, I will hand over to Sir John. Thank you. Well, thank, uh, thank you very much indeed, Neil. Um, I'm afraid it's uh, rather outrageous, uh, outrageous of us not to uh, introduce such uh, distinguished colleagues on the panel, but I rather fancy they're well known to you, and it'll be more important to hear what they have to say than for me to tell you what you already know about their distinguished pasts. What I propose to do in the limited time we have, 50 minutes to cover in the Middle East, is uh, wholly inadequate, as all of you will realize. Uh, the world may have been made in seven days, but the Middle East in 50 minutes is beyond anyone's capacity, I think. <laughs> what I would uh, propose to do is to ask both of our guests, uh, beginning with uh, Dr. Al Baradai, to speak for about six, eight, up to ten minutes. Uh, we will all make a brief introductory statement. The questioning is then for you and we will summarize very briefly at the end. I apologize in advance that we won't be able to cope with every aspect of what's going on in the Middle East, but I hope we can touch on the issues of greatest concern. So, Mohammed, would you like to start? Sir John, thanks. Uh, I'll try to touch on the many issues at stake, of course, right now. Well, clearly the Middle East is going through a radical change. Uh, it is not unexpected. I mean, I think it was change that everybody was waiting for. Uh, it's basically about freedom. It's about social justice in, in different variations. Uh, governance, in, in other words, you know, lack of good governance with all that comes with it, uh, corruption, uh, obscene gap between rich and the poor, poverty, violence, uh, the, all of that has been there for many, many years in the Middle East. And uh, finally, it, it is coming out to the surface. Uh, Economic development, obviously, which is something of interest to you, is, is a major issue there because the whole 400 million uh, Arabs export the same as, as much as Switzerland with 8 million people. So there is, there is a major issue of economic development at stake. And with that, also obviously, a major issue of economic opportunities. But there's also a major issue of economic disparity. You have Saudi Arabia with 440 billion economy. That's 14 times as much than Yemen, you know. Uh, you have regional conflicts, which I should touch on, obviously two major issues, uh, Palestinian-Israeli issue, which is getting from bad to worse, in my view, and that, you know, casts its shadow on the entire region. Uh, the Iran issue right now, which is, which is again coming to the surface, it's Iran versus the Gulf, but more importantly also Iran versus the West. and. Uh, and it has many aspects to it, ideological, you know, uh, security issues. Uh, you have, then if you go to the, to the national issues, you have sectarian tensions that are, have not been there, but it's coming out to the surface as part of, again, the instability. You have Christian issues in Iraq, in Egypt, you have Shiite and Sunni, something which was not really there before or becoming very palpable in Lebanon, in Iraq, in Yemen, in Bahrain. Uh, and then, of course, you have 9-11, the war in Iraq, Afghanistan, deteriorating situation in the Palestinian territory, which is creating an overall conflict, if you like, or perception of conflict between the Arab slash Muslim world and, and the West. Uh, and that is not, is not very, very helpful. Uh, we are going through a process of transition in Egypt, Tunisia, Yemen, uh, different ways. Tunisia, I think, is doing much better than, than the others. The Egyptian process of transition, unfortunately, is very muddled. Uh, uh, in, in Libya, it's, uh, it's again problematic because of a tribal dynamic, because of the lot of arms that has been left, left behind. Uh, Syria is a major issue, you know, and how do you deal with it? 
are you are you talking about you know military intervention? Are you talking about regime change? Are you talking about political settlement? Uh, Bahrain again is is there somehow at at the heart of the Gulf. Uh, in my view, the outcome in Egypt would be crucial for the entire entire region. Uh, but we have we have a lot of issues. Uh, the most important is the absence of law and order, which is not which is not very which is not there, which is a puzzle. Uh, with that, obviously, deteriorating economic conditions, fundamentals are not are not good at all. Uh, and then we have a very co constitutional transition that is confused and erratic. Uh, so I, I'll end with the challenges we are we are facing, and I think in different ways in both at the national and regional level. It's a law and order, uh, and that again goes from what you see in Libya and some of the provinces trying to have so-called federal systems uh, uh, to economic fundamentals, which again are not picking up. Uh, the relationship between religion and rights and freedom is at the heart of many of the issues in the, in the region, how much, you know, religion becomes part of the law, how much you, you will leave it to be a, a guy, guiding, guidance by example or, or enforced by law. That's an issue has been in the Muslim world for many, many decades and still coming out to the surface right now. Uh, the dismantlement of the old structure, uh, which is transitional justice, if you, if, is, is a major issue. A weak civil society. Uh, Unrealistic expectations. There's a lot of unrealistic expectation. People expect that after a revolution, they should see, you know, the fruits of their of their work. They haven't seen that. I'll end by saying there's a lot of risk, but there's a lot of opportunities. Uh, lots of risk that the re the whole region can go slide backward, but a lot of opportunities that if we do it right, you know, that finally we could have a, an opportunity to have a Middle East at peace with itself and with the rest of the world. Mohammed, thank you very much. Bye. Thank you, Sir John. Uh, well, indeed, uh, the, the world was created in seven days. The Americans tried to beat that record uh, back in 9th of April 2003. They missed that deadline and now still nine years and still going. Um, the, uh, the change in the Middle East, uh, that is basically the, the Middle East uh, was facing in terms of like the change and politically, economically, uh, uh, a social governance, um, cultural, it's so significant is, that it undoubtedly will affect the world uh, at large. Um, not because it's strategic location, not because it's uh, political uh, dynamics, not because it's cultural diversity, but because it's what it's really hold, and this is uh, affordable energy, and I'm going to talk on that latter uh, matter, leaving politics to the expert to debate. The OPEC, uh, con uh, the OPEC me me member states hold amongst them in the Middle East uh, about 840 billion barrel uh, uh, of um, of oil, and that is. Um, constitute 60% to world's proven reserve. But that 60% is the cheapest extra, uh, extractive 60%. This is beside the 43% of the gas reserves. And for that reason, those conventional resources are so essential uh, to be um, protected and to be uh, sustainably extracted uh, for the better of all, not just in the Middle East, but the world at large. And that's why any development or any um, negative downside, basically, on, on, um, on the Middle East will undoubtedly hit market um, <coughs> world economy uh, uh, to the very heart. The, I just wanted to state a few energy facts uh, and leave it uh, as uh, thought to the thoughts, basically, and for you to, to ask later on any questions. OPEC's estimate of uh, 2012, uh, now, it's uh, produced about 80, 88 uh, million barrels a day. By 2015, 
the world needs 93 uh, in terms of like world demand. Uh, by, t uh, by, by 2035, the world demand will increase to 110. This is 22 to 23 million barrels extra that the world needs. This is twice of Saudi Arabia. The question is, do we really have to rely on one um, swing producers like Saudi Arabia, or do we need to really uh, find alternative or more swing producers, or invest more in, 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 in spare capacities? The IEA, International Energy Agency, has estimates in terms of like investment required in the energy sector to meet demand by 2035. The world needs to invest 33 trillion US dollars. This is twice the GDP of the EU. World's estimate in terms of like, well, sorry, World Bank's estimates in terms of uh, ga flared gas, uh, just only within the Arab states plus Iran, it's 33.3 BCM of gas per annum, two thirds of that just from Iraq and Iran. And MENA consumption, the Middle East and North uh, Africa's consumption on gas is increasing uh, today at uh, 10 to 11 percent uh, um, steadily. And this ought to increase, and most of the increase is shifting because of <laughs> gas to power. And, and also, the crude is now, more, um, a, a lot of consumption on the crude is now being few, um, used to fuel uh, power generation. LNG uh, is, is another issue. Uh, if we want to talk about how much uh, going to Asia, uh, there's about um, 86 BCF, uh, sorry, BCM of gas going, uh, um, of, of LNG going to Asia. Most of that from the, uh, all of that, sorry, from the Arabs, uh, from, uh, coming up out from the Strait of Hormuz. Just to put it in perspective of, uh, to equate that into battle oil equivalent, uh, if we take Qatar, for example, uh, produce about 77 uh, million ton per annum of LNG, that's uh, e equivalent to nearly 5 million barrel oil equivalent in calorific uh, content. And this, uh, basically, it has to leave the Strait of Hermas, and I highlight that word. Now, when it comes to the energy play, we really need to take into consideration a number of things, energy security. And that energy security is always uh, taken into consideration from different perspective. Consumers look at it as security of feedstock. Producers look at it as security of demand, security of outlets, and so on. Uh, the Saudi Arabia, Iraq play, uh, they have high aspirations. Saudi Arabia would like to maintain its status as the main producer of oil. And uh, while investing very much on gas, increase this gas production from 1.6 uh, BCF uh, back in 1981 to 10.7 BCF of gas as of today, with aspiration to move that by 2020 to 16 billion cubic feet of uh, production. This is a huge aspiration. The question is, uh, what are the measures uh, in terms of like accommodating such investments? And do we have to take into consideration the increasing consumptions locally and the impact of security uh, dynamics that have taking place? So all of these need to take into consideration. Uh, and last but not least, I would like to uh, conclude is that <coughs> market volatility is, is, is harmful to all producers and consumers. And uh, really, it's about time for consumers and producers to exchange the right data and plan for a better future, not to leave uh, the market in the hands of uh, speculators. Thank you very much. Louis, thank you very much indeed. Um, what I'd like to do in a few opening remarks is try and respond to some of the questions I've been asked in private meetings around the conference over the last uh, two or three days, and then we can uh, turn to questions. 
I suppose for most people last year, the debt crisis and the Eurozone dominated market thinking. I think it's very likely this year that it will be the Middle East. And the concern uh, is evident, the risk of conflict, the fear of conflict, and the danger that any conflict would pose both to oil supply and consequently to oil price. And the focus there in most people's minds at the moment is Iran and what may or may not happen uh, as a result of Iran's present political position. Let me make a couple of assertions about Iran. I think Iran is undoubtedly developing the capacity to make a nuclear weapon. I draw that distinction, the capacity, whether she will actually proceed to making it is a moot point. But I think she's certainly developing the capacity that would enable her to do so. Beyond that, of course, she continues to use proxies such as Hezbollah to uh, support Shia movements across uh, much of the Middle East. Intelligence suggests that Iran is advising and very possibly partially funding the Assad regime in Syria. In Iraq, as the Americans leave, she's supporting radical Shia movements. And wherever possible, Iran seems to be promoting a sort of undeclared war between Shiites and the Sunni Arabs of the Gulf. Now, one of the ironies of present, uh, of present views is that so far as one can see, and I emphasize that, so far as one can see, Iran's defense expenditure has actually been declining in recent years, uh, whereas partly because of the threat Iran is perceived to be, expenditure has increased in Saudi Arabia and in the Gulf countries. Now, this may have a perverse effect. The increase in overall military capability in the Gulf may well encourage Iran to use her reducing capacity to concentrate on gaining a nuclear capability despite the international pressure not to do so. Every action has a reaction, and that might well be hers. One wider problem is that Iran's search for a nuclear weapon and Saudi Arabia's present coolness towards the United States runs the risk of leading to an arms race across one of the most unstable regions in the world. For several decades, the Saudis have seen the United States as a protector in times of trouble. It goes back to the Carter Doctrine and even before. After America was perceived by Saudi Arabia to abandon President Mubarak in Egypt, the Saudis are less confident of American support if they were under attack. So as Iran arms itself, it is likely Saudi Arabia may do the same. That is the assessed fear. In Syria, we have all seen what's been happening, brutality, turning Syria, I think, into a pariah state. Thousands killed, casualties mount daily. The danger of a wider conflict evident, and it does seem to me to be possible that Syria is becoming the playground for wider conflicts in the Middle East, much as Lebanon has often been in the past. Difficult to see exactly what is going to happen in Syria, except that if the regime survives, and I thought last year that it wouldn't, they have been so ruthless, I am less certain of that now. But if the regime survives, I think it will only do so as a pariah state. But if it doesn't survive, we of course have little idea what will actually replace it. Alongside those conflicts, we have the long-standing uncertainty of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. We've known, this is very frustrating, we've known for years what a settlement looks like, but politics gets in the way, and I frankly see little sign of an early breakthrough at the moment, indeed quite the contrary as positions harden. So the face of the Middle East is changing, the remarkable events of uh, last year and what is still continuing to happen. And the final shape of the Middle East is pretty uncertain at the moment. One worry put to me constantly this week that I might mention in a few moments is the danger of a military attack upon Iran to disable her embryonic nuclear facilities. No one can know what's going to happen. I would personally judge it very unlikely that the United States would attack, but warlike noises from Israel keep the fear very much alive. 
There's quite a lot of dispute about that, not least within Israel. At least two former heads of Mossad have denounced the possibility of a military attack and said how foolish it would be. And I must say, uh, I tend to agree with them. The impact is unknown. It could well create a wider conflict in the Middle East. It could well spike oil prices, such, a, such an attack, to levels we haven't previously seen. And I think those enthusiasts for a military strike would do well to ponder on the economic consequences of that event, as well as the political consequences of that event. One of the dangers of these disputes is that at the moment, they seem to bleed one into another. You can't just look at Syria, just look at Iran, just look at Egypt, just look at Yemen, and regard them as though they were all neatly self-contained. <clears throat> They're far from that. And of course, the combination of them do offer risks to security, risks to the market, and risks to the oil price. Um, I'd like to say just a brief word about the forthcoming uh, full impact of the oil embargoes on Syria and Iran. They may hurt their revenues when they take full effect, though historically, though Loewe would know much more about this than I do, historically, actions like that were pretty unsuccessful. Think Cuba, think Rhodesia, think immediately after the first Iraq war. The danger there again is if Iran responds aggressively, an aggressive response might again spook the markets and unsettle the oil price. Financial sanctions look to me as though they would be a much more effective uh, weapon. There's also the danger that the law of unintended consequences may apply. An oil embargo, if it creates hardship, might actually consolidate Iranian support behind the regime to a greater extent than they have it at present. It may well cause friction in oil prices, and Iran will be looking to uh, replace the lost market, just as others will be looking to replace the lost supply. Plainly, Saudi Arabia would be the most obvious source of uh, replacing any lost supply, but I think Iran would regard that as a very hostile act since, uh, since uh, uh, oil is about 80% of Iran's hard currency earning and 50% of her central government revenues. And then the reverse question applies, what would Iran do in order to find alternative markets? I think she would look to the east to do that. I don't see where else she could look. But two of the biggest potential markets, Japan and South Korea, would both, for different reasons, be vulnerable to American pressure not to buy the oil, uh, particularly while North Korea remains a threat. So I don't think it will be very easy for Iran to find alternative markets. If they look to China, uh, they may well find the Chinese would negotiate a very competitive price indeed for any additional uh, oil that they might, uh, they might buy. So Iran's retaliation options are pretty difficult. In theory, they could close the Straits of Hormuz, but I think that would be very unwise and therefore very unlikely. America, I think, in those circumstances probably would intervene. And in any event, if they did that, they would damage their own ability to export as well. So it's difficult to know exactly what Iran could do. It could worsen instability in Iraq. It could pressure the Gulf countries. Uh, at worst, it could even threaten the Gulf facilities. It has a missile capability of doing that. But all that is very uncertain, and people will need to focus on that. Just briefly on other issues, the aftermath of the revolutions last year is interesting to observe. Uh, Tunisia has held successful elections. Yemen, to put it kindly, is in flux. Um, Mohammed has talked about uh, Egypt. Egypt, critically important, the, the mother state for all Arabs and the biggest Arab state. It's plainly crucial what actually happens in Egypt, and it's not the happiest scene in the world at the present time. Economically, you'd think Libya had cause to be optimistic, but tribal conflicts in Libya are potentially very damaging indeed. So the degree of uncertainty is quite significant at the present time, and I think we are wise to keep a very close eye on what happens and to see how it develops. What has yet to happen may well determine what the final outcome is. So one is uh, clearly in the position where we have to make assessments 
and cannot be certain. Unsatisfactory, but that, I'm afraid, is the real world in which we live. Now, that's a very sketchy run across the surface, but I think we can now open the floor to uh, questions and see if we can fill in any of the holes that you have doubtless perceived in, uh, in what we have said so far. So if you could indicate your wish to ask questions in the usual way, and I will pick out the raised hands as I see them. Who would care to start? Yes, second row. There should be a microphone coming in the interest of the audience generally. If you could wait for the microphone before asking your question, that would be helpful. Dr. Mohammed, what is your latest estimate on uh, uh, what timing of the Iran's nuclear capability? Well, I, I'll have first a, a short comment on Sir John, you know, Middle East. We are, I think, when, when he, he mentioned that we are, you know, each conflict bleeds on the other. I think my fear that the, the Middle East right now is an auto, on an autopilot, you know, and, you know, you, you cannot, you, nobody is really trying to look at the big picture. All these issues that we talked about are very much linked to each other, you know, and uh, whether it's uh, the regional issues, uh, the national issues. Uh, there are two issues that ought to be settled, have to be settled, and uh, without them being settled, the, the, the region will continue to be in a, in a mode of anger, humiliation, uh, extremism, you know. And that, the first one is the Palestinian issue, obviously. It has been going on since 1945, and it's going from bad to worse. But I come to your question of, of Iran. And Iran is a, is a much more than just the so-called nuclear capability. And uh, Iran is an ideological competition in the Middle East between Iran and the West. Iran would like to be recognized as a major regional power, and they are. And uh, I think if they were, to, if they are to, if they were developing a capability, uh, it is precisely to force that recognition. You know, and I Iran will never be settled. Let me be clear: by sanctions, by use of force, it can only be settled when people, not people, the U.S. and Iran, sit around the table and negotiate a grand bargain that has been. The, the aim for many years has been mismanaged by all sides on account of domestic politics, unfortunately. Uh, Iran, in my view, it's still being very much hyped, the nuclear capability. I mean, even you know, the fact that they will master the enrichment technology, I mean, they are not the only country in the, in the world. There are 13 other countries. Uh, Iran are not just a mad mullahs that they are going to acquire nuclear weapon and go and, and use it. They know. No country, in my view, including North Korea, will use nuclear weapons because they know they'll be pulverized. Uh, if you want, it's a question of security. It's a question of how to establish mutual trust. And that is not going to happen by sanction from one side, by Iran trying to retaliate in the region uh, uh, you know, for, for the sanction applied, applied against it. You need to sit together, the, the US and Iran, and you know, and both of them has to blink at the same time. It's right now each one is waiting for the other to blink, and that's not going to happen. You know, and uh, they need to blink together. They both need each other. The U.S. and the West needs Iran badly for Iraq, for Afghanistan, for Syria, Lebanon, for for the Palestinian issue. Iran needs the West badly in terms of technology, in terms of trade, in terms of interaction, economic and and, and political interaction. So, uh, why we have not being able to settle the Iranian issue, which, which harks back to the 1953. I mean, again, when you talk about Iran, you have to look at the background. You know, when the first national elected prime minister was deposed by CIA or MI6, Sir John, I, I don't recall, one of them, you know, but... Uh, <laughs> but it wasn't uh, me. <laughs> <laughs> and then you, then you got the hostage crisis in 1979. Uh, then, then you got the... <clears throat> The West support for Saddam Hussein, you know, for the Iraq-Iran war, where a million Iranian has been killed, chemical wep weapons have been used. So you need to take all that, you know, into account when you you, you put yourself in the Iranian shoes. Iran want to yes. to be acknowledged and recognized as a major power. Iran want to probably there are issues that you need to discuss with Iran: support for extremist groups, human rights record, all that. But the, all the U.S. and Iran has to sit around the table 
put all their grievances and fi find out a way to live together. Otherwise, I think we will continue to see more you know, hype, more tension, more instability. I have to be very clear, there is no military solution to the Iranian issue. You can bomb you know, a, a facility, but you cannot bomb a knowledge. If you were to bomb the Iranian facilities, that would be a, a license for Iran to go for a crash course to develop nuclear weapons with the full support of the entire world, let alone you know, the, all the other measures like the Hormuz, the Strait of Hormuz closure and all the other stuff. Yeah. I right. uh, can't agree more with all the excellent points highlighted by Dr. Baradi, but I would like to um, add one more point. Uh, it is rather difficult to rule out the possibility that um, Israel may attack Iran. It happened in the past. Israel attacked Tammuz nuclear sites uh, in southern Baghdad back in 1981 without any consultation, without, any, uh, without even informing the UK or the, or the US administration at that time. And at that time, Saddam Hussein was much closer, or if not friend to the uh, Western nations, and leading uh, a war against Iran, and, 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 and basically in bed with the GCC countries. So the possibility is there. However, Iran today is not Iran of the early days of the revolution. They are strong, they have influence, they have uh, um, social extensions and cultural extensions in so many countries. And that's why the ideal way is dialogue, dialogue, and dialogue. Even sanctions uh, so had to be really considered carefully. We all saw the sanctions uh, during the 90s uh, imposed on Iraq. For 12 years, sanctions did nothing but strengthen Saddam Hussein and led to the death of more than half a million child in Iraq, despite the deprivation that faced uh, by the Iraqi people. So when it comes to uh, resolving this issue, I'm afraid we have no option but investing in more diplomacy, not a PR diplomacy, but serious diplomatic affairs. Well, I can just uh, emphasize a couple of very important points I think have just been made with which I entirely agree. If Iran actually had a nuclear weapon, could she actually use it? She would have a single nuclear weapon. She would have no second strike facility. And the moment she used it, she would be utterly unable to protect herself against the retaliation that inevitably would come. It would be an act of supreme folly to use a nuclear weapon, particularly with such a modest supply as they would have. And I think that is a point that actually needs to be registered, that Mohammed made. It's very difficult. The second point is, I think we would all be wiser to try and get in the head of the Iranian psychology. Iran was Persia. Iran had a worldwide empire when the British were living in mud huts and no one had discovered the United States. And they know that. And I think megaphone diplomacy actually is counterproductive rather than supportive. If one can sit down and negotiate, that is plainly what we should do, and that plainly should be the objective. And the, the constant threat hanging in the air that someone is going to use a military weapon actually damages the chance of proper negotiation and serious negotiation, essentially with the United States, who are the power that really matters in this particular instance. And I think one has to focus on some of those things and try and get below some of the very windy rhetoric that we have heard from a number of quarters over recent years. Right, next question, please. Bom, 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 bom. Yes. Um. Thank you, honorable panel. I uh, absolutely agree. I think military would be, would be counterproductive. Um, however, I think the issue is on the Israel side. I understand that US is trying to suppress Israel uh, not to use uh, the military solution, but uh, you know, uh, the situation, of course, is somewhat um, uh, strange by that. 
um, Israel has been has been you know more aggressive you know in terms of trying to use military strike, but uh, I agree is absolutely counterproductive. Uh, my, my question, I guess, to the panel is uh, how what what is the uh, situation with the president of Iran uh, in terms of his popularity within the country? Uh, I understand. I was told. I don't know whether it's accurate or not that uh, actually he is not that popular. Uh, and it could be, you know, it wouldn't be possible to be overthrown within the country, thereby, you know, eliminating the, you know, mm. uh, other you know, military strike or whatever. Uh, how do you, what is your comment on that? Thanks. So, hey, would you like to start on that? Well, Iran, unlike other regimes, um, the, the system is very much uh, initiated by uh, the support of the Ayatollah, the Marjaiya there, and the Bazaar, the, the, the merchants, and so on. It's quite complex. It's, uh, there are so many institutions. Uh, I would envisage change in faces in terms of like the first tier, but when it comes to the theme, the ruling theme of Iran, it's going to stay for many years to come. Uh, and uh, for this, uh, the world need to learn how to deal uh, with uh, this country and nation. Uh, as I said, they have a significant, significant extension and influence across the, 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 um, the region. They've invested over the last 30 years in, 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 in strengthening their position, not just within the border of Iran, but beyond the border of Iran. And, and, and for that, uh, they, have, uh, they will continue to have influence at policy level, at, uh, politically and, and commercially. I mean, look at what's happened in, in the GCC. I mean, they have, for example, differences, as, for example, uh, with the UAE over um, the Tumbu Sogra, Tumbu Kubra, and Abu Musa. But uh, on the same uh, level, they maintained uh, uh, diplomacy and commercial trade with Dubai and with uh, other Emirates. Uh, and uh, they wanted kind of like to balance that relationship and separate politics between trade and so on. And this, this, is, this is just for exa an example. Same thing that uh, in Iraq now, uh, despite the sanction and, 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 and the pressure on the Iraqi government, but uh, they are heavily involved in Iraq and political decisions there in, in Iraq are heavily influenced by Tehran. Um, election results could change. Uh, forget about uh, just the generic influence. So they, they have an, 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 an influence, and, and we have just to, de learn, uh, to deal with them. Yeah, I, I think I put it right. I mean, the idea, and I heard that from every Western ambassador coming out, after four or five years of service in Iran, that the idea of a regime change in Iran, change, major change in orientation, is, as I was told, a fiction, that it is going to stay, it is there to stay. And the world has to understand that to, how they can arrive to a modus vivendi, living with a country uh, with a lot of influence in the region with a different ideology. I mean, it comes to mind, you know, China and the US. You know, uh, you should be able to find a way, you know, to provide mutual security, to live with each other by different ideologies. That's not going to change. But to start jumping into regime change and calling each other the great Satan and, you know, an and axis of evil is not going to help. It, it, it just will, will be, make the region more, more unstable, more, more angry. And, uh, the idea, again, what you talked about, the, the Israeli, I mean, the idea of the Israel bombing Iran for possibly having a technology that could one day lead them to have one bomb while it, the Israelis are sitting on 200 nuclear weapons, you know, it just, you know, it, put yourself from the side of the, of the Muslim world of the Arab world. I mean, I mind you, and which is not very good, I mean, the Iranian program, nuclear program, is supported by overwhelming, you know, majority of the, Arab Muslim population that it will finally establish a balance of power. It's all about security. It's all about, you know, about balance of power. And uh, 
that's what I said. You know, you, you don't you cannot just leave the Middle East on an autopilot while the rest of the world is wringing their hands, doing really nothing other than just look and say, you know, maybe you can looking at symptoms rather than addressing the fundamental causes of insecurity, you know, in that region. Sounded for a few moments like a plea for the return of President Nixon. <laughs> <laughs> Um, the point about the president of Iran is that the real power doesn't lie with the president. Yeah. Um, indeed, the president is actually in a fairly weak position within Iran. He has opponents on every side, including former presidents. The supreme leader has just appointed one of those former presidents who is a hostile opponent of Ahmadinejad to senior positions. So I think Mr. Ahmadinejad, it, whose oratory has inspired so much of the dispute over recent years, is actually in quite a weak position. Wherever he goes within Iran, he tends to meet demonstrations from young people when he visits schools. I suppose the other point to make, as a former politician, I make this tentatively, uh, but it is not entirely unknown for people to make speeches that appeal to their own particular core vote. And I think you'll find Mr. Ahmadinejad has done that on a number of occasions. His particular support comes from the, the uh, lower income classes in Iran. He makes speeches that appeal to them, and they're very popular with them. But when they resonate outside Iran, they seem very hostile and very damaging. And I think you have to be aware of what those speeches mean and how much power he's got, and lay off quite a bit in determining the fact that the real influence on policy lies elsewhere and not with Mr. Ahmadinejad within uh, Iran. Next question, please. Yes. Um, it was suggested earlier that Iran wants recognition, um, presumably as the preeminent power of the uh, Middle East. If that recognition is forthcoming, uh, could I invite you to speculate as to what the Middle East and Central Asia might look like? Hamid? Well, I think it would look would look terribly better, you know, if if you like, you know, it's uh, Iran want to be, you know, have security assurance that it will not be subject to attacks or or intimidation or sanction or whatever. Uh, the rest of the world wants from Iran that they will not support extremist groups or and probably improve certain issues, domestic issues and human rights and other, although that cuts across the region. Uh, but I have been making the point for the last year at least, as the Middle East is going through change, radical change, it is crucial that you have the non-Arab countries, Turkey, Israel, and Iran, on the right side and not on the, on the, on the wrong side of, of, of things. You need to make sure that they will help the Middle East go through a process of evolution and not explosion as we have seen in Libya and possibly can see also in, in Syria. So uh, a cooperative a mode, co a cooperative mode between all the countries of how they can, you know, build trust, mutual trust, not necessarily the same regime, you know, will, will I think have a soothing, great soothing impact on, on the whole region. And then you need to focus on the economic development. I think well, one issue which we, we didn't talk about, you know, it is the economy stupid. I mean, uh, just get, get the economy running. And then a lot of these issues, theological, sectarian, you know, issues will, will evaporate, you know, once people start to, to see hope. You know, when you have a region now when you have a lot of people who have no hope for, and no future, and it's easy, you know, to wrap themselves around religion or theology or te or sectarian tension, what have you. So uh, basically, look at the big picture. Basically, the U.S. and you know and, and other major power need to to get into the you know and and come with with solution and not just solution that deal with the underlying causes and not just the symptoms, as we've seen that we issue a declaration there by Security Council or a G8, you know, statement saying, oh, God, that's not good. That, that's not going to help. That's not going to work. Thank you. Do you want to comment? Or should this, we move on? Yeah. Okay. Let's see if we can get some more questions. Yes? Third row, please. You, you said Egypt one. was crucial to the region. What do you expect to happen in Egypt oh, going I forward? Oh, I just want to have it. 
Mohammed, I think that's for you. Egypt yeah, being crucial to the region. Yeah. Well, Egypt is still uh, going through transition. It's still work in progress. I would obviously would have liked to see a more logical, you know, uh, process of transition. We have we have we have going have been going through a very muddled, you know, process of transition. We are going through a presidential election without even having a constitution in place. So the president would not know his job description. You know, it, uh, it's a uh, it's a very convoluted way, and we still, the two major issues is still lack of law and order security. The old regime is still holding to, you know, the police force. Uh, and of course, the economy, which is in a terrible shape. All the fundamentals are, are very gloomy. It will take time, but two things which makes me hopeful. The culture of fear is gone. Egyptian youth are 60% under 30 years of old. They're, they're all fully aware of what's happening. They know what they want. They, they, so, so social networking have become very active and they, they know their way to the street. So they will adjust that system. I think, uh, it might take, it might take a couple of, couple of years, but it will, it will move in the, in the right direction. Right now, I think, again, the focus should be, you know, on economic development. The good news that the so-called Islamists who are, have the majority in, Parliament and in, in government are very much free marketeering. I mean, many of them are quite wealthy billionaires. So, they, so I would say, I mean, the, the first priority right now is to focus on economic development, lift the around 50% of the Egyptian who live under the poverty level, deal with the 34% of illiteracy. Once, again, to me, economic development, you know, once you get a middle class up and running, then the question of, you know, democracy, freedom of expression of religion will, will naturally come. I, I, I look at South Korea as a good model in that, you know. I think the, that question and the answer actually raises similar questions about Iraq. And since we have a specialist with, her, with us, I'll ask Louis to comment on Iraq and what is happening there at the moment. Yeah. Well, um, the, the good things about the Iraq side has, has moved from the phase of regime change to a very much regime making. But the uh, challenge that facing Iraq at the moment is that this regime made, making phase is taking too long. And uh, one would have hoped that uh, after nine years, Iraq in a much better shape. Unfortunately, with the lack of... Um, responsible leadership and with the um, um, overwhelming mismanagement and the deficit of uh, in, in the good governance, it really left the country rather uh, uh, dysfunctional. Uh, Iraq so far um, uh, has generated over 400 billion US dollars of oil revenue, yet failed to have a new teaching hospitals and, uh, or um, main highway or air airport uh, to be notable. And the issue is, uh, beside the fact of the um, um, ineffective administrations that took place, is because of the liability that had to deal with and the bureaucracies and the old regimes uh, that left behind after 2003. One need to remember that Iraq has moved from a central regime to a federal regime. Now, this cannot happen uh, with a press of a button. Uh, it's a all complete mindset in terms of like governance. This will lead into the, the, the change that had to deal with from moving from complete totalitarian dictatorship to democracy that is still nascent democracy. And the third thing is the um, um, the, the market economy that's moving to from a very much state-controlled uh, setting. So all these dimensions are rather challenging uh, for the new cha new regime uh, to, 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 to adopt and, and have it up and running in, in, in a um, foreseeable future. Thank you very much. Now, we're running out of time. We have time for one more question. We always talk about Iran making a nuclear weapon, but a weapon in itself is thousands of very complicated components, and it does seem a little bit uh, inconceivable that they're domestically making all of those components themselves. Uh, in the last country that made the bomb, Pakistan, we know that companies in Britain, France, Switzerland classified a lot of these components as non-sensitive and sold them to Pakistan. So how comfortable are we that the West 
is not putting commercial interests in front of geopolitical interests. And there is the dynamic between NATO, Russia, and China, rather than Iran itself, which is at play. Mohammed, I think this is right up your street. How, how confident aren't we, are we that third countries aren't supplying the components to Iran to make a nuclear weapon? Well, we haven't, we haven't seen, I mean, what we have seen is, is components, you know, and designs in, in terms of enrichment capability, but not the weaponization part. I don't think we have seen any of that. Iran is advanced enough, in my view, that they can probably, I mean, and some of the concern that they are adjusting their payload of their missile or what have you. But the, the key point I, I would like to emphasize here that you cannot make a weapon without having nuclear material, you know, the highly enriched uranium or the plutonium. And all the nuclear material in Iran, as far as everybody knows, is under International Atomic Energy Agency safeguard. So for them to be able to develop the one single weapon we're talking about, they need to kick out the inspectors and, and that will give the world enough time to do what they would like to do at that time. So again, the fact that they are doing computer simulation and all that, you, you can't have a weapon without having the nuclear material with the, the crucial component. Whether they're getting advice from some other countries on as I said, weaponization component, uh, initiators, uh, uh, how you adjust your, your missile, that's possible. But we, as I said, we haven't seen more than advice on, on the issue of, at the theoretical level, let's say, but not necessarily components. And after the AQ can ring at that time, I think the export-import control has become much more, much more strict in, in that sense. Uh, since Mohammed is probably the world's expert on this issue, I don't think there's anything that we need to add to that. I'll just ask uh, both Luay and Mohammed if they would like to, just in one minute or so, assuming they were suddenly entrusted with the power of the President of the United States and the President of the European Commission, what they would like to see diplomatically to begin to change the face of the Middle East. Would you like to have 90 seconds on that? Well, yeah. I mean, nine seconds is ample. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'd like I'd like to see, you know, again Barack Obama resuming his effort for a direct dialogue with Iran, something which he personally undertook like a couple of years ago. Unfortunately, it fell victim first on the Iranian domestic uh, politics and then on the uh, American domestic politics. He understood fully, and I think everybody else that there is no solution to the Iranian issue except through direct dialogue, negotiation, agreement with Iran. I think you need to put as much pressure on Mr. Netanyahu and company to understand that the Middle East will continue to bleed as long as you have the Palestinian issue is still, is still holding. And, uh, uh, and again, advice that they should stop talking about, you know, uh, regime change, about acts of evil, and start talking about us working together, living together, condemned to live together. Uh, that is the only way. Work on Iran, work on the Palestinian issue, help in all these countries where we are going through fundamental change by, ad by advising on how to build a strong civil society and by trying through providing direct foreign direct assessment and economic investment. And there's plenty of that. Economy and education is absolutely key essentials for a Middle East to, to move in the right direction. Right. Yeah. Um, well, uh, President Obama mentioned during his campaign back in 2008 that uh, one of his main objectives on uh, withdrawing troops is to secure a responsible exit from Iraq, as opposed to the irresponsible entry back in 2003. Well, looking at what's <coughs> happening today in Iraq, I can assure you that his exit, although it's very much welcomed by all Iraqis, but the approach is taken it was very much a responsible exit. And for that, I would like to try a new president. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that's a grace note you can't top. Um, I'm afraid we have run out of time. I'd like to express uh, my thanks to Mohammed and Louis for what they've had to say. Thank you all very much for being here. For those who... Uh, those who have the stomach from moving from one intransigent problem to the next, we can discuss Europe in 10 minutes' time. Thank you all for being here.